So we are in our third week of this series we're going through at the moment uh, called Unanswered Prayer. It's uh, created by the um, 24-7 prayer movement and particularly based on Pete Gregg's book, God on Mute. Uh, the Bible, as we're discovering, is often more honest than the church about how we deal with pain and all of the deep questions that come from this. So we're following Jesus in the final days before his death. Uh, and two weeks ago, we met Jesus on Monday, Thursday, as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, and throughout that, we looked at the heart question, how am I going to get through this? Uh, but this Sunday, we're thinking as we enter into Good Friday, based on our reading from Mark, the more intellectual question, why? Why am I suffering? Why does suffering take place? Why am I going through this? Why is God letting this happen to me? Why do my deepest prayers seemingly go unanswered? If God is all-powerful and all-loving, why does he allow so much suffering? We're going to try and unpack that just a little bit this morning. But it's really important that we don't keep these questions in isolation, simply theorizing. But actually, they are a deep reality, probably for every single one of us who has ever prayed that deep, <coughs> gut-wrenching prayer why, O oh Lord? Why, O oh Lord? It's a prayer echoed by the psalmist in Psalm 10. O oh Lord, why do you stand so far from me? Why do you hide when I am in trouble? And the reality is that most of us do not have to think very hard or for very long to think of situations in our lives where God has not answered our prayers in the way that we hoped and longed for. I've been praying for over 20 years that my oldest friend would come to know Jesus. And still that prayer has not been answered. Surely God wants him to have a life-giving relationship with Jesus. So why hasn't that prayer been answered? And I, as I'm sure you have, have cried out to God for people who are ill or who are dying, that God would he heal them but I've seen those prayers seemingly go unanswered. And surely God wants everyone to be healed. So why? Why does that not happen? So just as we start, take a moment for yourself to think of a prayer that maybe you're praying at the moment, maybe you prayed in the past, where you felt God has been silent, where you feel like it has gone unanswered, and I'd love you to just, in this moment, to be honest with God about the feelings, to be honest about how that makes you feel when that prayer gets unanswered. Just take a moment of quiet to bring that before him. First and foremost, I think God wants us to come to him with honesty, to be real with him in the midst of our unanswered prayer. And the reality is that Jesus has been there. In our reading this morning, we heard Jesus' harrowing cry to his father. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the chosen one who came to seek and save the lost, he is God incarnate, but here on the cross, he feels abandoned. He feels that God has completely forsaken him. And Jesus is articulating the universal question that I think every person asks. 
Where are you, God? Why have you left me? So why? Why aren't our prayers answered in the way that we hope and expect? Well, in the course, Unanswered Prayer, Pete Gregg lays out three helpful categories to help to answer this question. And I want to suggest these, that they are a framework for us rather than offering any kind of neat or complete answer or explanation that we might be hoping for. But they are God's war, God's world, and God's will. So firstly, God's war. The Bible clearly teaches that some of our prayers are not answered, even if they are in line with the will of God, because there is an enemy at work, resisting and opposing and acting against God's goodness. There is a battle. And as Christians, we're not shielded always from the weapons of the enemy. I think every single one of us here can agree that evil is a reality in our world. There are things that happen that don't reflect the heart of God. There are things, in fact, that are opposing that heart and opposing his will. Pete Gregg explains that spiritual warfare is real. Sometimes we need to stop fighting against God and start fighting with him against the enemy of our souls. It is a really difficult subject to engage with, to talk about an enemy, an opposing evil force. And we don't have time to go into it this morning. But there is an enemy at work. And we need to be, as Christians, prepared and ready for when that attack comes. But the question is, do we as a community lean too hard on one side of the equation? So either we focus so much on hope that we aren't honest about our pain, or we focus so much on the pain that we fail to have hope. How do we hold both of these two things together? So God's war. Secondly, God's world. C.S. Lewis, fantastic book, The Problem of Pain, you may have read it, says this, nothing can seem extraordinary until you have discovered what is ordinary. Uh, as a family, we've been watching Blue, uh, sorry, Planet Earth 3. Has anybody else been watching that, Planet Earth 3? Okay, it is absolutely brilliant. You've got to watch it. It is incredible. The photography, the ability of the men and women, the camera men and women, to catch the most intimate shots about some of the most rare animals. It is unbelievable. It, it literally blows my mind. And I'm left saying, this is amazing. This is incredible. This, this is a miracle that this exists these incredible, intricate realities of creation. And the fact is, God has established certain principles. He has created the world in a particular way, natural laws that make our world work. And in one sense, for me, it is a miracle that these things take place. It is the wonder of creation. And I would encourage you, go and watch Blue Planet. Uh, sorry, Planet Earth 3, and use it as worship. It is, I, I thought about this, it is literally like a mini personal worship service because you've got this incredible opportunity to worship and praise God and then the challenge comes, as is often the case at the moment, where David Attenborough says, actually, these situations are broken and are hurting because of the impact and that drives us and calls us to pray. So go ahead, use it, mini worship service. Go and watch that, I'd encourage you to. We are part of this mind-blowingly complex system that has been designed, and that does work for most people in most places most of the time. So a miraculous answer to prayer, which we should absolutely pray for, 
is by its very nature supernatural. It's extraordinary. It's God, in one sense, breaking his natural laws. So we shouldn't expect that God is some kind of mad inventor continually tinkering with creation. C.S. Lewis again said that the very conception of a common and therefore stable world demands that miracles should be extremely rare. God is not a control freak. He's not a helicopter parent, always swooping down to come and rescue us out of those bad situations. No, as we thought about last time, actually God is there alongside us in the midst of us. Miracles have to be the exception rather than the rule. And they are rarer than maybe we want them to be, maybe even rarer than we need them to be. Again, Pete Gregg says, miracles are rare, not because God doesn't love us, but because his world is infinitely complicated. So God's war, God's world, and then probably the most challenging of the three, God's will. John 14, I'm just going to turn to it, you might want to as well. John 14, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Verse 12, and he says this to them. It's on page 1,251, if you're interested. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to the Father. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. We can expect that miracles will happen. Even greater ones, Jesus is suggesting here, than what he did. But did you notice some key things there? Verse 13 is really important. You can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. When we ask in the name of Jesus, it's not about the words that we use, but about aligning ourselves with his desires. Are my purposes in line with his purposes? Am I stepping into his will? And secondly, we see, verse 13, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Does our prayer bring glory to, our, to the Father? Does our longing for a miracle to take place mean that he will be high and lifted up? Or will it be something or someone else who will be glorified? And that is a really important test. It's the reason why... When I pray, I need to ask myself, is the answer that I'm looking for so that I look good or more holy or show what a brilliant ministry that I have, or is it to bring glory to God? Rick Warren writes, when the request is not right, God says no. When the timing is not right, God says slow. When you are not right, God says, grow. And when the request is right and the timing is right and you are right, God says, go. For many uh, years, I thought cricket was a pretty much a non-sport. Anyone else agree with that? Pretty much a non-sport. I thought it was boring. I had little interest in playing and absolutely no interest in watching. And then I met a guy called Dan Christian. Some of you might know Dan. Dan and I worked together up at All Saints for over four years. Dan is obsessed with cricket. And tragically, tragically, his love of cricket rubbed off on me. In fact, so much so that I will often listen to a test match on radio. Can you believe that? I am pretty ashamed of what has happened. Now, as I got to know Dan 
as we grew in relationship, as we became friends, his love of cricket rubbed off on me. And he also impacted me in lots of other ways, uh, important ways, definitely, but don't tell him. Now, in cricket, here's where I'm coming to, the two batsmen are running between the wickets, and they will need to coordinate the decision about whether to run or not. One will shout, yes, and that's, okay, yes, let's run. Or they'll say, no, and that's, no, stay where you are, don't run. Or wait, wait, and that's ultimately, let's wait and see what happens before we decide to run. In one sense, God hears all our prayers, and in one sense, he answers them. When we ask God for something, the response will often be yes or no or wait. And the more time that we spend with him, the more we understand his will and what he wants, the more able we are to hear that response of yes or no or wait. The more time we spend in his written revelation, the Bible, the more we seek him in prayer, seek wise people, the more we listen to his Holy Spirit, the more in tune we become to his answer. It's an intentional process. It requires time and effort. But ultimately, every one of us know here that that is not easy. And it is definitely not a neat answer that maybe we long and hope for. So Pete's just going to unpack this just a bit more. So here's a clip uh, from the video. He says... When tragic things happen in spite of our prayers, mm. surely we then just can't shrug our shoulders and attribute everything to the mysteries of some unfathomable heavenly master plan. No, that's right, yeah. Um, and then if I pray for, for my friend to become a Christian, she's still not interested after all these years of praying, but surely that's in line with God's will for her life, so why isn't it happening? It is so important to remember that prayer isn't binary. And so let's just think about your, your, your friend that you're praying for. There are at least four different variables that come into play every time you pray for your friend. So firstly, in prayer, there is your personal will at work, right? So uh, what you want in the, the, the situation. And in this context, that's your friend getting saved. Yeah. That's super simple. Secondly, there's God's will. And that's a variable because it isn't necessarily the same as your will, right? But in this particular instance, since 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says clearly that God is not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance, we can safely assume that God also wants your friend to get saved. Mm. So what's the problem here? You are clearly praying in line with God's will for your friend. So why isn't it working? The problem is that there are two other wills also at work in this situation, okay? So firstly, there's the will of your friend herself, and God will not, and you cannot override her ability to make choices, even when they're bad ones. And then finally, there is the disruptive willpower of the one that Jesus calls a liar and a thief. This means that frustratingly, you can't force your friend to do an alpha course, no matter how many Bible verses you quote, how much you fast. But you can increase her chances of getting saved by influencing her environment through the power of prayer. Mm, that's really helpful. Influence rather than control. I like that. The reality is that God's will is incredibly complex. The book of Isaiah, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. And the psalmist writes in Psalm 8, When I look up and think about your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you would think of him, the son of man that you would care for him? Sometimes we want to know everything to be, we want everything to be understandable. We long to know the answer and to figure out the reason why. 
But if we strive for understanding, it can impact our ability to trust. Let me say that again. If we strive for understanding, it can impact our ability to trust. Often we need to come to a point where we lean into God because we don't understand or can't understand. Of me leaning here on this uh, lectern, or you sitting there on those chairs. I'm not a physicist. I might not be able. I might be able to give you a very basic answer to why, when you sit down on that chair, as you did in full trust this morning, that that chair will take your weight and you won't come crashing to the full. But I'm not a physicist. And so I don't understand the gravitational forces involved or the load-bearing requirements of the wood. But every single one of us, in one sense, took that act of trust as you came and sat down on that chair this morning. It's the image of Peter stepping out of the boat and walking on water. And as he walks towards Jesus. No doubt all of his understanding, his head knowledge, his experience as a fisherman would have told him that this step of trust is absolutely ridiculous and frankly a foolish act. If he leans into his own understanding, he would have never stepped out of the boat and never have walked on the water. But instead, he chooses trust. He trusts in Jesus. And it's that trust that enables the impossible to happen. And of course, if you know the story, it's when Peter takes his eyes off Jesus, when all of his understanding, his knowledge and his experience kick in, then he begins to sink. As we heard from our Second reading in 1 Corinthians 13 this morning. We see in part. We don't see things fully. We see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But I do want to say this. If you are in the midst of a tragic situation where you are deeply crying out to God so that he would answer your prayers, being told that you simply need to trust more is not necessarily helpful. And I think the only way that we can grow this spiritual muscle of trust is to lean into Jesus in the small things, and then we're more able to when those big things come. We grow that muscle when life is going okay, when life feels good. We trust in the small things so that when we do come to that time of pain, that muscle of trust will already be strengthened. It's this image of leaning into Jesus this morning that I really want us to take some time to allow the Spirit to speak to us. We're going to come to sing again now, but I want and I'm asking that the Holy Spirit would fall in this place and that he would speak to us about that area where we might be experiencing unanswered prayer and that we would strive to lean into Jesus, to trust him rather than necessarily finding all the answers that we hope for. So we're going to come and sing now. And I'd invite you to stay seated. You might want to join with the singing, or you might want to simply listen. You might want to respond physically. That's really helpful for me to do a physical act, to respond to what the Spirit might be saying by doing a physical act, whether coming to kneel or to Put your hands out in front of you. And let's respond and allow the Spirit to be present and to speak to us this morning, to lean into him rather than our own understanding.